Um, welcome everyone um, to tonight's program. We are thrilled to have you. Um, I am Carolyn Hoffman. I am the director of the newly launched um, Sinai Temple Mental Health Center. Um, we launched in July and um, I'm thrilled to um, be hosting tonight's uh, live performance uh, presentation rather with um, Ariel uh, Friedtanzer and Abe Friedtanzer on death and dying in television and movies. Um, we are streaming on um, streaming live on the Sinai Temple Facebook page and I think YouTube as well. So um, we are planning on going for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes tonight. Um, if you are live on our on Zoom or um, please feel free to enter in questions. We will be, um, they will be fielding questions um, towards the end of the presentation and um, I'll be reading them from the chat. So, um, uh, a word about the Mental Health Center. Um, the uh, center was meant to open the conversation around the importance of mental health and move toward destigmatizing mental health struggles um, in the Sinai Temple community and in the larger community as well. Um, we are a visible and accessible professional resource to all Sinai Temple members, staff, board, and clergy. The establishment of the center speaks to Sinai Temple's commitment to the understanding that our emotional life is essential to what makes us human, to our communal responsibility to respond compassionately when we are faced with challenges and to promote practices that support positive mental health throughout our lives. Um, tonight's program. Um, again, I'm thrilled to welcome to Sinai Temple, to our programming um, audience, um, Abe and Ariel Friedtanzer. Ariel is an MA and an end of, <coughs> excuse me, end of life consultant, uh, trained as an interfaith chaplain with a background in Judaic studies, bioethics, and social work. <coughs> she has brought conversations about death, grief, and advanced care planning to individuals, communities, and professionals of all ages and backgrounds. During the pandemic, Ariel hosted a weekly Facebook Live series, uh, Millennials and Mortality Mondays, and has facilitated virtual memorials and celebrations of life. She is determined to reduce the stigma around aging and the fear of death by helping people um, by helping people have these difficult conversations early and often. Her husband, Abe Friedtanzer, is a freelance film critic who has been writing about film and TV for the past 15 years. He is editor of MoviesWithAbe.com and TVWithAbe.com and contributes reviews, interviews, news articles, and award Awards predictions for a number of sites, including cinemadailyus.com, uh, the Film Experience Awards Radar, Awards Watch, Shock Ya, Juicy, and TV Over Overmind. Uh, he has covered numerous film festivals, including Sundance, uh, Essex, SW, Toronto, and Tribeca. Follow him on social media. Uh, at Movies with Abe, exclamation point. Um, without further ado, I'm going to turn um, the evening over to Abe and Ariel. Welcome. And we're all eagerly awaiting your presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Carol. Well, thank you for having us. We're very excited to be here. It's nice to uh, get to talk about movies and TV anytime, and especially nice to do it with Ariel and a uh, merging of our interests uh, with the Sinai Temple community. Thank you so much for having us. Um, it's it's really nice to be here back in our home community, my home community and, and our new community. Um, and, and it's great to be talking about this. Like Abe said, um, 
this is a, a really interesting niche intersection of our work. Um, there aren't so many ways that our different passions overlap. And so we're really excited to be here for that. Um, so we wanted to just kind of start off by letting you know a little bit about how we got into this work um, very, very briefly, and then specifically um, where we saw this overlap happening. So I uh, am, I've always been excited about uh, film and TV. I went to NYU, studied cinema studies and journalism, uh, and it's nice uh, to uh, be able to uh, just talk about all this stuff. Um, it's also the week of the Oscars, so a particularly exciting week uh, of the year. Uh, so it's it's fun to be able to look back at other films. I don't know how this year's class rates necessarily in terms of its portrayal of uh, death and dying, uh, but there's a lot of great stuff to get to uh, to think about. Um, and uh, like Carolyn introduced in my bio, um, uh, this this is something that's always sort of been a passion of mine from a really young age. I was always very comfortable at funerals and uh, even, I won't say excited to go, but felt like there was really um, a connection, a meaningful connection and closure um, that came with being there, whether or not I was close to the person who had died. And so um, I didn't realize until later that that wasn't something everybody experienced at funerals, um, but it was something that I uh, feel very lucky to have experienced and that it's brought me into this work. Um, and I would say in the last few years, um, more and more on screen, we've, especially during COVID, when we were watching a lot of, t lot of TV um, and many, many more movies than, well, for me, many more movies than normal. I think for Abe, it's been about average. Um, but we also were living with my parents, Brenda and Harold, um, for 11 months. And so we were watching a lot of um, film and TV together. And it seemed like every other night we were saying, oh my God, death is everywhere. Or grief is everywhere. We were kind of looking at each other, feeling like this was something that was newly coming up. And the the interesting thing is, I think in some ways, it actually is newly portrayed in film and television um, in a different way than it has been in the past. Um, I think in many situations, it's a little bit more realistic than it has been um, over the, the course of film and TV history. Um, and I also think that given the work that I do, we're a little bit more attuned to it when we do see it on screen. So um, that's been a really interesting kind of change and sort of drive towards this conversation. There's nothing uh, to start this conversation off that feels more relevant to the last two years than something about dealing with death during COVID. And fortunately, even though that's something we've a lot of us have had to deal with. Movies and TV have also dealt with that because people creating content uh, have been through things and had different ideas. Um, and so what we'd love to do to start off is show the trailer for a very new film, Family Squares, uh, that was released just a few weeks ago and is available uh, on demand. Hi, everybody. Not all at once, please. Katie, are you doing some modeling on the side? I don't think the light's big enough to get rid of the lines. Ah, God damn it! Good. George Burns once wrote that happiness is having a large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city. Where are you? Oh, I think I'm in Arizona. Well, George Burns didn't know so. Hi, y'all. Welcome to my death. Are we supposed to say it's okay, no. you can die now? Goodbye, Mom. Wait, did she die? Grandma! I miss it? Did, did I miss it? Is she dead? How come I didn't get the link? Mabel wanted to address you all directly. If you're seeing this, I'm not with you anymore. You've all been acting like jackasses and keeping so many secrets. Wow. One of you is not a sibling. Lots of kids look different than their parents. Yes, they're called adopted. Turns out that there was embezzlement going on. Fraud, fraud, fraud! I'm the only one who tells the truth in this video! Oh my back! I know. Come here, you gotta crack my back. God, you've gotten so fat. Yeah. Also, we are rich. Oh my God. <laughs> These things are usually, uh, you know, a little juicy, but this one was a doozy. They say you can choose your friends, not your family. What would my life be like if it wasn't for you guys? But you can choose to be friends with your family. I have so many things I want to tell you. I may have made a mistake and I wanted to talk to you about it. Small mistakes can be fixed. Big mistakes, some are so big that they 
change everything, they change you. The drama of this family. We have to talk to Graham as a state attorney. Good luck with that meeting. Everybody just stay on the same link for the attorney. Hello, friends and family, again. <laughs> I'm confused. It's me again, Alex. I'm a licensed attorney. It kind of made sense for me. You know, I had the office space. Who, who found him? Katie. One price. Uh, I am in the penny saver. He's in so, the penny uh, saver. <laughs> I'm back. Just kidding. Still dead. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, listen, how about this? How about I'm going to make a statement, and if it's a true statement, then you don't have to correct me. Is what Michael has incurable? Yeah, that's a question. You got to... It has to be a, right, state, has to be a, a statement. statement, and then the truth. Right, so my statement is, what Michael has is incurable. That's it. So I'm thinking, before it gets bad, I want to end it. I don't want to change things, you know? I want to make some pizzas. I want to play some Paddleton. They got a whole process that they give you the pills you can take, but I don't want to do it alone, and I was hoping you'd help me out. Don't, don't drop it! The places where you could fulfill the prescription is six hours. Guess we're gonna do a little road trip. What's the worst case scenario? We're What's the worst case scenario? We run out of gas here. Next thing you know, we're drinking our urine. How do you get from running out of gas? The next step is drinking urine. Fastest land animal. 40 miles an hour. The cheetah goes 60 or 65. It's so I'm the dying guy. I know guy. you're the dying guy. Stop saying I'm it. the dying guy. I'm the other guy. Fake it. If you had to live like this, you could adapt. This you... is how bees see. I... No! No! Who thought you were dead? can't give up. Miracles happen. No, sir. All right. Um, so, again, there's a lot to unpack. Um, so, like Abe, Abe mentioned, um, when we saw this, I really was, I thought it was insane um, that he didn't know what this was about before we saw it. And something that I didn't mention in my introduction, um, but I think is really relevant here is that I did my master's thesis on medical aid and dying and the uh, Jewish attitudes towards it. So for me to, to not only see a film that really uh, centralizes on death, but one that has medical aid and dying at its center, um, that was just amazing. And it was really interesting to be part of the conversation, the talk back that happened afterwards and to hear from the director and the stars um, about what it was like to make a film um, with a topic that is really very controversial um, in many communities across the United States. Um, and that also, again, is done in this comedic way. Like, I think that's something that's so interesting um, that, that between family squares, between this um, and with so many other examples that we'll show you, um, there's so much comedy and humor in death. And I guess growing up, I always thought that that was just how my family handled a lot of it. But um, I, it's something that that obviously works and it gets through to people. So moving to something a bit more dramatic, having the conversations with loved ones. We are fortunate, just like with Family Squares, to have something that was released in the time between when we decided to do this program and having the program that we have a great clip that we can show from a very popular show that deals a lot with uh, with grief and with loss through a clever um, uh, way of looking at time. And that's This Is Us. So if you're not fully caught up, since this is very recent, hopefully we're not giving you any spoilers. Um, I think that the the premise of this clip um, is something that's pretty old news, um, but we just wanted to put that out there. I'm a little nervous, so I wrote down some notes. Um, there is no easy way to start this. Um, when Dad died, it was a shock, right? We were all left scrambling, trying to figure out our roles and how to move on. Um, and the one 
silver lining of this awful disease is that I have the opportunity to make a plan. To try and ease some of the burden. So, first things first, um, no matter how this thing goes, no matter how slow or fast, if decisions need to be made for me, Miguel is the captain of that ship. We have talked through every sad scenario, and the last thing he needs to deal with are disagreements about my care. So I need to hear you all agree to that. We agree, of course. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Great. Thank you. All right, so um, we didn't actually want to show the, the entire scene. Um, we just wanted to focus on that part. Um, and the reason that we did is because um, for me, especially with the work that I do and um, the drive that I have to help people have advanced care planning conversations, um, this was mind blowing to me um, to see this on screen. I, I, I honestly, like, I don't know if there are other examples I can think of um, without really, really trying to, to come up with one. Um, of a conversation like this that's happened on screen. And so I, I think I remember we were sitting in our living room and I went, yes, I was so excited that this was happening. So um, I, this is amazing. And um, if you watch This Is Us, um, and even if you don't, I encourage you to, to uh, watch this episode, um, if, if for nothing else, but just to see how this conversation goes. So again, I think that um, in this, we really see Rebecca, um, played by Mandy Moore. Um, she's the mom. We see her you know, struggling a little bit at the beginning with how uncomfortable this conversation is. And again, I give them credit for doing that and for not making it look like an easy conversation because it's really not. Um, but having her sit down with her family and say, this is what's important to me. And the first piece of it for her to designate who her medical proxy is. Um, which is her husband, Miguel, um, and to have her family. And again, it's all three of her children on board and give verbal agreement. Now, of course, we have no idea what happens at the end of her life yet um, in the show. And so we don't know how that plays out and if they agree and if they respect Miguel or any of the other many situations that we know can happen in real life. Um, and that I'm sure many of you are thinking about right now. But it's really beautiful to see that she is sitting down in a calm moment and having this conversation with her family. Um, there are many situations in which families might, might not have that conversation altogether, um, either for the sake of the family members or for the sake of the person uh, initiating the conversation. Um, but what I think is so beautiful here is that she's designating a medical proxy. Um, she's obviously already had that conversation with Miguel and um, she's telling the rest of her family who it is. Um, so, so often in my work, um, I see that, that when advanced care planning is done at all, which is not very often, um, usually there is some sort of form where a, a person designates who their medical proxy or their healthcare power of attorney is. Um, and that's great. If they're doing that planning and they're designating that, that is one checkbox and that's great. Um, but it is so rare for them to have a conversation with that medical proxy and tell them that they are designated as that medical proxy. Um, oftentimes in a marriage, it might be assumed that it's the other person. Um, and it might actually be the other person and that's great. And, uh, in many states, that is the default. So um, if people are married, that's where they're going to go. And if not, it might go to adult children or to a parent. Um, but it's really important to sit down and have that conversation with the medical proxy. And it's also really important. Um, I would say like only slightly less important than that conversation is having the conversation with the other people who might think they would be the medical proxy. Because even in a family where, let's say, none of the adult children are the medical proxy. Um, somebody outside the family has been chosen to be that role. You wanna make sure that the, the adult children all know that that's the case because it creates a whole lot of tension and a whole lot of strife um, in the moment you need to make those life and death decisions. And unfortunately, so often we are left making life and death decisions literally in the middle of a crisis. Um, I, I actually, Abe and I did discuss the um, placement of this clip after the Paddleton clip, because as I said, we're trying to move through this arc um, of how we usually see um, 
the, the process of dying happen. And I really, really strongly believe that having that conversation should happen before the diagnosis. It should happen um, today. <laughs> if you want to have that conversation with your loved ones tonight, I absolutely encourage it. Um, or tomorrow, or at least start working on it and, and figure out when you can set that date and have that conversation. Passover is coming up. It's a really good opportunity. Um, so uh, feel free to reach out if you have questions on how to do that. But it really is a, a, an opportunity to have that conversation, at least to start it, um, no matter how old you are. You're old, young, we've had this conversation a whole lot of times. Um, so I really believe that it should happen before that moment of diagnosis um, and before, definitely before that moment of crisis. But unfortunately, so often we are um, not catalyzed to do it until there is something that changes our status um, or the status of our loved ones. So at the very least, um, before you get to that moment of crisis where you have to make a life and death decision, make those choices for yourself, determine what is most important to you at the end of life um, and have that conversation with the other, um, I would say the other the other decision makers, the other people who are invested in your survival um, or, or not survival, depending on your choice. Um, okay, I think I said a lot about that, Cliff. <laughs> it was loaded. I was really excited. Moving on to anticipatory grief and anticipating death. Uh, there's another popular film that we were able to see at Sundance. Uh, if it's not clear, Sundance is a great film festival, which produces a lot of films, some of them about death. Um, this film later won a Golden Globe. It stars comedian Aquafina. Uh, this is The Farewell. What's wrong, Dad? Please tell me. Your nan is dying. She doesn't know, so you can't say anything. The family thinks it's better not to tell her. Why is that better? Chinese people have saying, when people get cancer, they die. We have to go to China. Wedding is an excuse so everyone can see her. He's my only cousin. Don't you think I should be there? You can't hide your emotions. If you go, nan will find out right away. Really? What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? 你说对吧？到了他的肩膀上，你说我的回忆，我又不在他俩在卧室呢，干啥呀？Shouldn't we tell her? Isn't it wrong to lie? It's a good lie. Most families in China would choose not to tell her. 嗯，你们说的啥呀？她在英国学习，所以她会说英文。结婚了吗？ She's dying. Can you be a little more sensitive? What do you want from me? To scream and cry like you? Ah! All right. Um, so uh, once again, there's a lot that comes up in the farewell um, that we can talk about. But a couple of things that I'd wanna focus on. Um, the first thing that that popped out to me when I saw this film was um, just the, the distinction in um, how our cultures view death um, and how they view illness and also how they view decision-making. Um, and that's something that's really uh, critical um, as uh, I would say, in some cases, a failure in our healthcare system um, that we in the United States really prioritize individuality and individualism um, 
and autonomy. And we don't always leave space for um, the fact that some cultures um, really prioritize the family making the decision or that the person who's dying doesn't know um, or that they don't um, they don't necessarily have the same investment in what happens with their body or with their life as their loved ones do. Um, and so I think that that's a really important piece of this film that shines through very beautifully. And at the same time, um, I can't help but ignore the fact that I really, really, really strongly believe that um, that people should all get the chance to say goodbye. Um, and this is something that, um, whoo, getting a little emotional talking about it, um, but it, it's really a priority for me. Um, and I think that um, both of um, people who are dying as well as their loved ones getting a chance to say goodbye. Um, and I also, I'm not gonna touch on this too much, but I also feel that way, um, even when the person who is dying or their loved one won't necessarily know, um, such as in the case of dementia. So um, that's a whole nother topic, but I do very much believe that we all have, uh, have a right and, and, and oftentimes a need to have that closure and be able to say goodbye. And the last thing I wanna touch on is, the um, the need to feel strong that um, you see Aquafina's mother uh, in the film. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember their character names, but um, you see her say, you know, what what do you want me to do? To scream and cry like you are, um, and then later you see another relative screaming and crying at the funeral, um, or maybe it was a funeral. I'm not sure what the the context was, but um, that need to feel strong is something that I hear so often. Um, that loved ones say, whether they're at the bedside of somebody who is sick or dying um, or in the aftermath of that loss, that they are so intent on being strong, whatever being strong means. Um, and they don't really give themselves the space um, to feel and express however they need to. Um, something that I often teach when I work with parents of young children about how to talk to their kids about death is that, um, they kids need to see the full range of your emotions. They need to learn just like they need to learn how to deal with anger and frustration and sadness. Um, they also need to learn to deal with grief. It is a very real emotion and um, it needs to be taught in order to be healthy in some ways. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes our grief is wrapped up in childhood experiences of loss that we haven't really gotten to process um, or haven't processed fully. And um, And so it's important that we get that chance to to really express them. Um, and the last thing is that uh, someone once taught me that signs are, uh, sorry, that tears are a sign of strength. Um, so the next time you or a loved one tries to hold back those tears to not um, to not really give in and to, to be strong for whoever they need to be strong for, I would encourage you to remind them or yourself that tears are a sign of strength. Um, and actually, I, so we didn't see this clip, but with Paddleton, um, going back to that film uh, from earlier on, there is a, a mention during it where the, the two gentlemen um, are speaking and uh, Mark Duplass says, um, when I, um, you know, I'm going to come back and visit you. And Ray Romano says, well, how will I know? Um, and you know, he says, like, maybe I'll come back as a butterfly or a gust of wind. And um, I only mention that because I think that it's really interesting that they're having that conversation about how he's going to come back and visit later um, before he's died. Whereas I know with me and with many of my family members, and I'm sure with many of you, um, we see signs and we attribute those to our loved ones because we believe that that's how they would come back. Or maybe it was something that was important to them when they were alive, um, such as in my family, um, my grandparents were um, avid poker players. And so when I see nickels and, and pennies found on the street, I assume that they're coming from them. So um, I just think that that's a really interesting, interesting note. Um, and lastly, uh, there is um, a show called Council of Dads, which we did not um, provide a clip for, but I would really highly recommend it. What is it on? Uh, that'll be in the okay <laughs> it, was, it was on NBC. <laughs> um so it's not on currently but um when it, it came out during covid um it is a really beautiful show and in that um and again i'm not giving anything away but in that uh, the father figure in the show um or the father in the show designates a council of dads that uh when he dies he wants to 
um, make sure to take care of his family. And it's really beautiful, um, again, in just the way that he's planning ahead and thinking of them. And once again, making those choices in the moment when he's able to rather than when he has to. So, uh, yeah, we'll move on from there. So when it comes to deathbed scenes, um, which is our next our next uh, sort of progression, next step in that progression, um, we did not really there were no deathbed scenes that we felt compelled to show. Um, and the reason for that is because um, it's. I think it's a, a, a space in which um, film and television is lacking a little bit um, in terms of realistic portrayals of deathbed, um, of the deathbed scene, or um, that doesn't necessarily have to happen on a, on a bed. Uh, it can happen in the street. It can happen at war. Um, but I don't think that those those portrayals are often realistic. Um, and the first thing that comes to mind for me um, is Grey's Anatomy. I'm a big Grey's Anatomy fan, um, but it angers me every single time when um, somebody codes um so their heart stops and they use the paddles and they charge them and they bring them back to life and immediately the person is talking um and you know going back to the the conversation and cpr you know almost even if it doesn't work um which is is definitely a realistic situation um when it does work they're again back talking and and there's no consequence from the actual procedure and so that's something that really um frustrates me and i hope that with um, death kind of being more um, accessible in our society, the, the more that we can move towards showing realistic death on TV, I think the more comfortable we will then feel with death off screen. Um, I think oftentimes we have no idea what's happening when we are at the, the bedside of a loved one who's dying because we expect it to look the way it does on TV um, and for you know them to go from speaking to to dead in in a second, um, and we don't often see the natural and really beautiful and spiritual experience that can happen at the end of life. And uh, one example that I always think of is the show The Big C with Laura Linney, uh, where a major character uh, has you know been sick for a while and then dies when her husband goes out to get flowers, uh, which I think is is uh, has a real poignancy to it. Um, and I think that that's also something that happens oftentimes in real life um, where someone is either waiting for an individual or a group of people to arrive um, or they are waiting for somebody to leave the room and then they die. Um, so our next clip um, is taking it back a little bit, I think, than any other clip that we've shown so far um, to 1991. Um, and this is from My Girl. So I think that this might have been the first example I had seen um, of death on screen. I don't believe I saw it when I was three, although it's it's possible. Um, and I think that this is a really, um, really powerful experience. Um, and I, I'm just gonna give the context um, that there are two characters um, and one of the characters they were, they were playing and, um, and they're best friends. And then in this scene, um, you're seeing one of them attend the other's funeral because um, he had uh, the Macaulay Culkin. I don't I don't know. His, I don't remember his character name. Um, he is stung by bees and he's allergic to bees. And so um, so unfortunately, he dies. And so what you're seeing in this clip is what happens when she um, when she sees him. Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. And he, he laid his hands on their heads before he left that place. Let us pray in silence. One good tree climbing Thomas J. His face hurts. And where is his glasses? He can't see without his glasses. <laughs> Put his glasses on. Put on his glasses. <laughs> he was going to be an acrobat. He's gone, sweetheart. Get He's away. gone. Theta, wait. Theta. Theta.
Okay, so um, I actually just mentioned to Abe uh, while we were um, showing the clip that this scene gets me every time. Um, it really is very powerful um, to see this child. Woo, I'm not gonna apologize for my tears because they are a sign of strength. Um, but uh, it's it's really very poignant to see how she reacts um, when she's seeing her best friend in a coffin. Um, and the other piece of context for this scene is that um, she's actually raised in a funeral home that her family um, manages this funeral home or possibly owns it. And so this isn't a girl who's unfamiliar with death. She, in in a lot of the movie, you can see her um, being very comfortable around the different pieces of, of death um, and the, the funeral process, but this is her best friend and she's a child and he's a child. And so she's relating to him as, as a child and as his best friend. Whew. I didn't expect that to happen. Um, great. And so um, the pieces for me that come out of this clip um, are a few. One is that we often don't engage kids in um, death rituals. Um, we don't, again, in, in this context, um, she, in this scene um, and in this film, she is very much exposed to death and what comes along with it. Um, but that's not common. And so I think we are hesitant to expose kids to death because we're afraid that we are going to scare them um, or they're not going to understand it. Or they're, I think actually mostly they're going to ask us questions we can't answer. Um, so uh, that's something that, that we can learn to do, um, that we can figure out how to answer those questions so that we expose kids um, to what healthy, um, what healthy grief and what, what an exposure to death looks like. Um, but it's also, it's not always a bad thing. And I think in this case, her parents really don't know how to handle this. Um, and she is not uncomfortable by going over to her best friend. She sees him as she did when she was alive. Um, so I think that in this case, she really needed to be included in that funeral rather than to come in and be surprised by it. Um, and again, I'll just throw in that plug for Council of Dads. Um, it's really a beautiful show. And uh, in that, um, in that storyline, uh, there's a whole family of children who are um, coping with the loss of their dad. And so, um, again, I don't think I spoiled anything, um, but ho hopefully not. Um, so once again, it's just a really beautiful way to see um, that the loss of a parent especially can be um, grieved, I think, and, and mourned by children in really different ways. There's no show, I think, that does death better and more frequently than Six Feet Under, uh, which we're not going to show a specific clip right now, but you could have a whole curriculum on this show about a family uh, that runs a funeral home. Most episodes start with somebody dying um, and involve the living characters uh, grappling with the nature of that death. It's really absolutely fascinating and, again, it features a lot of funerals and it is unlike anything else I've ever seen. Uh, the Kaminsky Method is another show that, uh, in its short three seasons, actually dealt quite a bit with death um, and with funerals and the idea of moving on without people. So that's really very, very compelling. That one obviously is a little bit more lighthearted. Those Six Feet Under also has its own comic elements. Uh, to move on to Immediate Mourning and Shiva, I think it's uh, there are obviously uh, Jews in show business, a lot of films about Jews as well, uh, and rarely ones that do a great job of looking uh, at Jewish rituals. And there's an interesting film that doesn't, even by the lead actor, Geza Rorig, who is uh, a religious Jew, even by his own admission, doesn't actually do it correctly, but does a great job of talking about how sometimes emotion affects uh, the rituals that people are expected to perform uh, and prepare for ahead of a crisis. Can I help you? You are a scientist? I'm a science teacher. I have questions. I'm not sure that I'm gonna be able to be of service to you, Rabbi. I'm not a rabbi. My wife, she died. I fear her soul is suffering until she returns to the earth. What's to become of her body? They use pigs. They most closely resemble people. 
The body is reduced to tiny bits of skin and bone. And how long does he stay? I suppose one could bury a pig. I don't imagine that that's a... Um, kosher? I buried the pig. We're having office hours here. Just realized nobody knows where I am. Should have left a note. This is unscientific at best. You mean a pig more like your wife. No offense. Oh, shit. Will this make you better? I hope it will. I'm here to see Schmel. He's a friend of mine, a, uh, a business friend. Look, it's a body farm in Tennessee. What's a body farm? We have on our hands a woman. She was buried six feet under back in June. What's that body going to look like right about now? Where did you say you were from? His blood is on our hands. His mud is on my carpet. What are you after, Schmel? What is this all about? I don't know. What's your friend's name? Uh, Schmel. Schmuel. Jesus loves you, Schmel Schmuel. So this film, the the way uh, that Geza Rorig starred, uh, describes it when it screened at the Tribeca Film Festival was, don't try this at home. This is not necessarily the way Judaism works. I can't imagine anybody uh, who is very religious would actually, you know, bury a pig to track its progression. But I think it does a really fantastic uh, job of showing how People turn to religion in difficult moments, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's it's natural or it feels right, uh, especially because this is not saying that Shmuel, uh, who Matthew Boderick is unable to pronounce his name correctly the entire film, as you can tell, uh, that that he he goes to this crisis. And you see one point where his sons are talking to him. Uh, there's a very interesting stuff about the idea of a golem in there. Also, it's really again, it's I, I it's a peculiar movie more than anything else, but it's a really interesting one. And it is it is funny in a way that doesn't reduce the idea of observant Judaism, but instead shows how people engage with it. Uh, similarly, I think that the mourner's Kaddish is something that people seem to know well and tend to use when they want to invoke mourning or death. Um, I know that it's something that was featured in a film we saw called The Sunlit Night, where one of the characters started reciting it, even though she didn't really pronounce any of the words correctly. And at one point, I think she just started saying the wrong words, but it was what she remembered, and that felt right the right, right thing to do in that moment. Uh, it's also present in a scene in The Handmaid's Tale, uh, where um, people who do not conform to the uh, religious zealotry that's happening there are sent to work camps, and one of them used to be a rabbi. Uh, and of course, there are two scenes in the show Homeland where Mandy Patinkin, uh, who is a very well-known Jewish actor who himself has, you know, good Jewish knowledge, starts reciting the Mourner's Kaddish, especially once uh, after a uh, terrorist uh, kills himself during an interrogation. Uh, and that's one where I don't know how appropriate that necessarily is or how much that would be mandated, uh, but it really is just an interesting signifier that I think anybody who has any inkling of Judaism sort of starts to recognize that and says, oh, this this is what we're supposed to do now. And it shows at least that that uh, his character Saul is a man of faith and that this is what he turns to when he knows that something uh, has happened that he needs to acknowledge. Grief is obviously a very big part of all of this, whether it's related to a death or not. Uh, one of the most poignant examples I can think of is there's a movie called Grace is Gone with John Cusack, uh, where he uh, his wife is uh, in the military and he is notified at the beginning of the film uh, about her having been killed uh, overseas. And it's about his efforts to reconnect with his daughters. Um, and also there are some poignant scenes where he's seen uh, calling uh, her phone number and, you know, trying to talk and ask for advice, knowing that she's not there, but still like having that sort of, uh, sort of comfort. Um, there's also actually um, a great show called Pivoting um, that we've been watching. And uh, in that also, there's a friend who, um, who has died recently. That's before the series starts. Um, and you see often that the, the friends are engaging in conversations with her um, ongoing, whether it's, um, through a phone or a birthday or by uh, having a meal at her graveside. Um, it's, it's really an interesting continuation of that conversation with her. 
Um, and similarly, there was a show several years ago called The Unicorn um, that was really, uh, it was kind of a comedic version of Grace is Gone. Um, also, it was a father uh, who became a widow um, and um, and he is raising his two daughters and he's navigating dating. Um, and uh, it's really interesting to see how the kids deal with it and how his friends deal with it. Um, and that he's really trying to balance this new life and trying to be the father of two, two girls um, without his wife present. Um, so that's just a kind of a funny version of, of that. Um, still dealing with, with very real issues. Um, but uh, the clip that we would like to show you um, is from a Facebook series um, called Sorry for Your Loss. And uh, we will pull that up now. I was online yesterday and said that if your spouse dies, it feels like losing $308,780 a year. How do you put a dollar amount on death? Like, how is that even a thing with the price tag? This is our home. This is our home. This is our home. This is where we're supposed to live. This is where we're supposed to live. Matt was the glue that held us together. I hate how in the beginning everyone wants to send you flowers and they stop calling and writing and doing nice things for you because they're over it and they expect you to be over it. You think you know him, but you really didn't know him as well as you thought. Do you know your husband's passcode to his phone? Doesn't everyone? You know, otherwise I'd wonder who he was texting that he didn't want me to see. My sister's in free fall. I just want to know things about him that I didn't get to know. Nothing makes me happy. Right now, but think about a year from now, two years from now. Matt was my favorite person, and now I'm just mad all the time. You have to show up for yourself. Whatever you need to feel, you get to feel it. Awesome. So um, I was really stunned when I uh, started watching the series because I felt like this was really the first show I had ever seen. And, and granted, it's on Facebook. It's not on uh, primetime television, but it was really the first the first series I'd seen dedicated directly to loss um, like this and that it was grappling with all of the real issues that happen um, in the aftermath of a loss and also in the anticipation of that loss. Um, and how the family and friends try to try to distract or um, support. It really was a really powerful series. Um, and the one thing that I I think is really um, beautiful that um, the the main character touches on is this bereavement dump. Um, that was a a coin a term coined by a professor of mine and. Um, that's the idea that, you know, we show up um, for in the Jewish community, we show up for um, a funeral and we show up for Shiva um, and we are really there in those seven days. Um, and then things start to kind of trickle off and people stop calling and they stop asking um, and they stop checking in. And it's really important for us to make note of those important days um, the anniversary of the person's death, their birthday, Mother's Day or Father's Day. Um, holidays where they're going to surely be missed. Um, it's really important to show up on those days and also on the random days where you might just be thinking about that person. Um, and uh, I actually, I had a friend's birthday um, a couple of weeks ago and we went to her birthday and I, I said to her, you know, this morning, for some reason, your uncle who had passed away several years ago came into my mind and I was so excited I was going to get to see him. And then had to realize that he was gone. Um, and so it was painful for me, but of course painful for her, um, but also something beautiful that we can share in both remembering him. So um, I, I think that that's a really beautiful um, lesson to come from this series. And it's also just a great series overall.
I'd love to use the presence of Elizabeth Olsen, the star of this show, uh, to pivot very briefly to an entirely separate genre of film and television uh, that allows us to think about death and grief in a completely different way. Um, Elizabeth Olsen stars in WandaVision, which was a limited series uh, from the Marvel Cinematic Universe on Disney Plus, uh, where she is, her character is so deep in grief that she actually creates an entire world uh, based on the sitcom she watched growing up uh, to cope with that. And it's a really fascinating, interesting way of dealing with death that I think is probably a uh, fantasy uh, expression of the way that some people sort of disassociate from reality. Uh, there's another show which is very dark, uh, but very interesting, currently airing, called Severance, um, which is where there is a procedure people can have to be uh, have their, their consciousness severed to their one person at work and one person at home, and they can't remember you know, the other while they're in one of those spaces. And the main character's motivation for getting severed uh, is that he has lost someone important to him and he can't deal with that grief. And so therefore, he knows that even if he doesn't consciously remember it, half of his day is spent not having to know that he lost somebody. Another film that's done that very well is Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, where people have procedures where they can actually uh, forget painful memories and have people erased. Uh, that's a really fascinating and truly bizarre film. Uh, there are also plenty of films that have zombies in them, which is a whole different concept of if we can't bury somebody or we still see their face, what does that mean? And that's a whole separate conversation that we won't get into now, but an interesting one, I think. Um, a show that does this well and isn't quite as out there or maybe terrifying is Pushing Daisies, uh, where uh, a pie maker has the ability to touch people and bring them back to life for 60 seconds. Um, but once he touches them again, they stay dead forever. And the premise of the first episode is he meets somebody who is his childhood childhood love and doesn't touch her again. So she stays alive, but he can never touch her or she'll die for real. Uh, so that's a very sort of quirky and interesting show. And another um, device that a lot of uh, movies and TV shows use is to have uh, people who have died appear on screen and share scenes with other characters. The Kaminsky Method does this very well with Alan Arkin. Um, and his character's late wife uh, is really very compelling, gets to see how somebody might have conversation, might imagine having conversations uh, with a uh, deceased loved one uh, and have that be seen on screen. Six Feet Under also does this very powerfully in a number of episodes where somebody worried about their own mortality gets to see somebody, let's say in one episode, there was a football player uh, who died of heat stroke um, and is talking about what he could have done with his life and all of that. Uh, to move back to the uh, religious Jewish Jewish um, way of doing things. Uh, there is an incredible film called Fill the Void, um, which is an Israeli film uh, about somebody who is uh, very part of an ultra-Orthodox Orthodox community in Tel Aviv, and her sister dies in childbirth, and her family talks about the idea of her marrying uh, the widower. And it's a very, really, really fascinating and well-done film that just looks at what happens after grief, after, you know, after a loss? How do you move on and go back to normal? Um, and there's another really compelling film that's actually mostly in Yiddish called Menasha uh, that deals with this and specifically about how the community looks at uh, and treats people after a loss. Gordito, I'm 
sorry that your son is not with you, but you know, you a single man. You could do whatever you want to do. Drink up. <laughs> Ik ben Tati, ik weet wat ze gaat voor hem. Maar ik ben Mansin, ik ga even van de. Ze gaat niet meer stoel. 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 So this is watching this trailer is a nice reminder of the fact that this this is a really, uh, you know, groundbreaking film in a lot of ways. Um, it was, uh, you know, one of the first, you know, all mostly Yiddish films uh, show also at the Sundance Film Festival. Um, and really just a very compelling look at how people struggle to move on and the community often struggles to let people move on. Um, and there's just a lot to unpack there. And this is a very sort of sweet way of doing it. Um, so uh, we are wrapping up, uh, coming close to the end of our presentation. Um, we do have one final clip for you, but before we get there, um, we did just want to mention that um, we know this is being streamed live on Facebook and on YouTube. And because we can't see you, um, please let us know that you are there. Feel free to comment um, on whichever platform you're watching. But also um, feel free to send in your questions. Um, I know that Carolyn is going to be fielding some of those and, and asking them. So please feel free to um, to share that. And also, if you have favorite, um, I don't know if favorite is the right word, favorite, we'll go with that, favorite um, death or dying scenes or um, examples of loss or grief on uh, film and television, please let us know because we'd like to hear them. As we mentioned before, anything that we've discussed tonight, any movie or TV show, we will be sending a list of where it is currently available to stream or rent. That's certainly subject to change, but this is where we were able to find it uh, as, of, as of today. Right. So um, we have just one more clip um, that we wanted to share with you, and uh, we thought that this might be a, uh, a fun one to end on. I think it's really great to like support females, particularly um, female entrepreneurs. Cool. In the future. <laughs> great. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Danielle! Don't Danielle! Please, Sonia! Maura is here and her daughter Stephanie. Jessica. Whatever. You should really talk to her, you know? No. It's just a job. Darling! Hi, Hi, Hi Mom. I'm so sorry for your loss. No funny business with Maya. Thank you. You think everyone that's by is experimenting? You have zero gaydar. Excuse me, kid. I lived through New York in the 80s. My gaydar is strong as a bull. You can't just like show up to like the after party for a shiva I, and like reap the benefits of the buffet. Yeah. She lost so much weight. Yeah. You think she has an eating disorder? Fuck is you a major again. Sweetheart, feminism isn't exactly what I call a career. It's not my know? career, it's a lens. Max worked for your father years ago. Really? Just try to behave yourself today. I'm not gonna blow him in the bathroom. Why do you keep looking over there? Hi, I'm Kim Beckett. I don't think she's pretty. Malibu Barbie is not pretty. I mean, she's just like basic. You are such a good kid. Are you on drugs? No, just kidding. <laughs> Is she okay? I already have a plan and a path, so... So you just study and uh, don't eat and go out with your beautiful friends. Is that it? <sighs> Is that your life? Yeah. Oh. Yes, that's my life. Wow, lucky you. Mom, 
Mum, mum, mum. Who died? So sometimes you can have an entire movie based around a death and you don't even know who died. Uh, this film, Shiva Baby, as you can see, is a bit of a strange film, but it's one that talks about a, or, you know, references a well-known Jewish practice revol revolving around death in its title, and yet really has nothing to do with that death and just mainly talks about how people can be uh, inappropriate uh, in many different ways uh, in a setting related to death. So with that, we will uh, turn it over to Carolyn um, for any questions. I think we'll just need you to be unmuted, Carolyn. Yeah, that would help. <laughs> um, first off, thank you so very much for this amazing, wonderful um, presentation. I know I've learned so much. Um, and um, I do um, want to remind, we do have a few more minutes. Um, please, if you're watching um, and you have a question for Ariel or Abe, um, now is the time um, to type into the chat and um, we'd be very, very happy to field those questions to them. Um, I, I do want to say um, that uh, I, I want to thank you, Ariel, for, for modeling for us um, your, your warmth and your honesty and your strength. Um, this is moving work and, um, and it, those, even for those of us who are engaged on a daily basis with end of life issues, with death and dying, with grief, um, we're human beings and, um, and we, we respond in an, you know, in an emotional way. And that really is the power, right? Of media, of movies, of television. We live in this, this time where we are bombarded um, with images, um, with stories, and um, how remarkable it is when we can kind of parse through the jungle of movies that maybe are entertaining, but don't reach us um, or don't teach us anything. So, um, for that reason alone, um, this was enlightening and special and your presentation, um, both as experts and as human beings um, was, was, was wonderful to be a part of. So I thank you for that. Um, I am not seeing um, any questions. So um, uh, it is late in the evening. Um, I, I had some questions, My, I, I'll, I'll ask a question have a few extra minutes, um, but I want to be sure to give you guys the last, the last word. Um, uh, I just to speak, you know, for a moment about what you see as the responsibility for um, for the media industry, whether it be um, television, movies, um, all kinds of media. But is there a responsibility that um, the industry has um, given the pervasive influence that, that, is, you know, that media has in our lives to portray um, death and dying grief um, in an accurate, meaningful way for us? I'm just curious if you might wanna speak for a moment to, to that issue. I mean, I think that there, that's an issue that applies to many, many things. I think very often, especially with all these true stories that are being adapted recently in uh, limited series like The Dropout, Inventing Anna, all that kind of thing, we see uh, dramatizations and all these invented parts of it. Um, and so why should that not apply equally to the way that we see death and dying? But as Ariel often mentions, uh, especially with the idea of you know, life-saving techniques that people end up with bruised ribs and aren't able to survive CPR and that kind of thing. And so I think similarly to what uh, that, that uh, to dust clip, don't try this at home. These are not <laughs> necessarily examples. Model Mandy Moore and This Is Us. Model that kind of behavior, but don't assume that, uh, you know, the way people die in movies and TV is necessarily realistic. 
um, look to it uh, as either a source of entertainment or education, uh, but not not your fact checking uh, source that should be relied upon for accuracy. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with Abe. I think that um, I, in some ways, I dare say this, and I did not get this pre-approved, but I kind of think in some ways, film and television have done us a disservice in in portraying um, a sugar-coated version of what death and dying looks like. Um, and I think, like I said, that I, I think things are changing. I think as we are um, very, very slowly becoming a slightly more positive death positive culture um, in the United States, at least, that we are, again, really slightly, but I think that, I think that film and television is kind of leading the way to that. Um, I, we, this actually wasn't an example we talked about, but a show that we've been watching is Upload, and um, that deals with the afterlife. And um, it's not the only show that deals with afterlife, but there really are so many interesting examples of ways that we're touching on this. Um, and I think even just uh, desensitizing our access or engagement with death, I think will allow us to engage in real life um, a little bit more fully with it. Thank you. And um, uh, uh, oh, we have a question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, real quick, I do want to say, um, uh, and I wanted to say it before, before we have to, to go off air, and I'm going to ask the question. Um, and I, if for those watching um, tonight or um, going forward into the future, um, grief is a, is a normal um, reaction to loss and um, connection and community um, is, our, is our greatest answer um, to healing um, through, this pro through the process. Um, and there is hope that um, we can integrate the loss into our lives. Um, I wanna say that um, should those who are watching have difficulty, um, reach out. Reach out to your family, reach out to friends, reach out to a professional, reach out to a bereavement group. Um, there is no reason why anybody needs to suffer um, the intensity of grief alone. Um, we're here for you. So having said that, and you're nodding, so, um, and you know, there, there are many, many avenues for, um, uh, for help. Um, question, um, uh, are there any films or television shows that you can recommend to watch with elementary school age children that tackle this topic? Well, that's a good question. I think that Council of Dads uh, mm -hmm. definitely does a good job uh, with that. Um, that's a, a short series. Um, I believe it's 10 or 13 episodes um, that you know is definitely a drama, but has some, some lighthearted moments, uh, but it is certainly uh, appropriate to watch uh, with children, whereas other shows like Six Feet Under are certainly not appropriate to watch with children, um, even though they sometimes do discuss that kind of thing. Um, there's also um, similarly a show that discusses uh, kids and their re relation to death, but is probably not good to watch with kids is Dead to Me on Netflix. Mm. Um, that is one with some, some content that is probably uh, best censored, uh, but does have some interesting thoughts about that. I will say um, we don't we don't have kids, so we don't have a lot of experience of watching kids shows. Um, but um, I think that children's books um, are really an amazing way to have conversations with kids about death. And I will say there have been many, many occasions. Obviously, we saw that um, I'm not one that is a uh, takes long to cry. Um, but there have been many occasions where I've been sitting in a bookstore sobbing, reading a children's book. So um, there are really amazing, amazing tools. And um, I would say that from what I know, um, Daniel Tiger seems to be something that really does touch on the social emotional um, uh, experiences of kids. And I know that that was a kind of a spinoff of Mr. Rogers. Um, so I know that at least those talk about death. Um, I, I remember when the Mr. Rogers documentary came out that there were 
Um, it specifically showed how Mr. Rogers handled death on his show. So I would say those um, might be good examples. Unfortunately, this is, again, it's not our forte, but there definitely are a lot of kids' books. And I would encourage you to reach out to us. Um, I think that our uh, contact information will be put in the chat. And if you want suggestions of books um, to read with kids, we've definitely got those. And um, and then as well, the, the shows that Abe recommended in terms of parents maybe watching and then learning how to discuss them with their kids. We were also fortunate to find after putting in all these programs that we wanted to mention into our presentation, that they're actually available on a wide variety of streaming services and platforms. And so I would encourage you to take advantage of the recommendation services that those services uh, provide. So basically after you watch them, it will give you a list of a number of things. We cannot necessarily endorse those, <laughs> But it's likely that each of these different platforms will take you on a whole tangent of uh, possible programming that could be very compelling. Thank you very, very much for joining us this evening for a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm sure everyone learned a lot, enjoyed, um, and uh, we will and um, contact info. Um, not sure if I should, do I read it? Can everybody see it? Uh, no. Want me to, to read um, it out loud? Yeah, well, we can, we can read those. No problem. Um, I believe that uh, our contact info is going to be put into the chats, but, um, um, you can reach me at, uh, facebook.com slash end of life questions, um, or end of life questions at gmail.com. So pretty easy there. And, uh, movies with Abe.com, TV with Abe.com or Abe at movies with Abe.com. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I wish everyone a lovely rest of your evening. I know for those of you on the East Coast, it's very late. Um, thank you for joining us and um, good night. Thank you for having us, Carolyn. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye.